Hi, my name is Neil Blevins, and this is a layer breakdown for the ink poster number one, which I did a number of years ago uh, for the ink book project. So what I'm going to do is, you can see here, um, I've got the image in Photoshop, and I have all the layers, and I'm going to go through all the different layers and show you how I went about building up this piece. Um, so first of all, this piece, um, it's, it's a realistic piece, but it's not exactly, some people say photoreal. I don't call this photoreal because it's still quite stylized. To me, photoreal is a very specific thing, which is it looks exactly like a photo would look. But this is a more realistic piece in the sense that um, it looks closer to real than, say, something that's more painterly. Um, there's another um, layer breakdown I'm doing of a more painterly piece I did. And one thing, if you watch that one and you watch this one, you're going to see that the processes are actually very similar. The main difference is, is that when I do something that's supposed to be more realistic, I tend to use a little bit more photos and a little bit more um, 3D in the image um, and a little bit of hand paint, whereas in the ones that are more painterly, I use much more hand paint and much fewer uh, photos in 3D. Um, but you'll see a lot of similarities between the two, and uh, hopefully by seeing how I went about constructing this, it'll give you some indication of uh, how you can go about doing something similar in your own artwork. So here we go. So first off, um, just so you know, if you go to neilblevins.com and you go to the CG Education section, there is uh, a tutorial where I discuss my layer breakdowns. And uh, when I make the different layers for a painting, I tend to use sort of the same layers over and over and over again. And so I have a default layer set that I start with. So um, check that out, but you'll sort of see how that works into um, this particular painting here as I go through all the different, uh, different layers. So let's start at the bottom. I will turn everything off. And let's pull that a bit bigger. And we start at the bottom bottom, which is the ground. And so uh, for this ground, just started with a uh, brown color you can see here, and then added just a little bit of uh, texture here using this brush that I use pretty frequently when I'm doing landscape. Let me just um, show this to you. Um, where is it? Yeah, it's this one here. So what it is, is if you look at it, it's actually just a set of flattened triangles. And each time you brush, it gives it a bit of a random rotation, uh, a flip XY, um, and um, some random scattering. And I find that it just it, uh, it gives this nice impression of a ground surface, as though these are sort of flat planes that are going off into the distance. So just used on here, uh, brown, then a slightly lighter brown, just add a, a base on here. Then uh, a very similar layer on top, which has uh, some more planes and also a little bit of uh, grain in here using just a, a very simple splatter brush, one of the ones that probably shipped uh, um, with Photoshop. Then here is when I first start using the very first uh, textures. So this is just set to normal with an opacity of 70. And let me uh, disable that for a second and turn this up to 100% so you can see what it is. Um, this was probably some sort of marble texture um, that I, I threw down there. And again, the, the uh, purpose here is just to add, start adding a little bit of uh, a photo texture down on, on the base here. And then I used a similar image up here. And this is something to note. Um, usually when I'm doing photo textures, no one surface is only one texture. It's actually a bunch of different textures that are all combined together. Uh, and in this case, I'm using masks to blend between them in, uh, in different spots. So then after that, um, this is just a simple layer set to hue, uh, which is just to turn the sort of yellowy color into something a little bit more, more brown. But otherwise, it leaves all the uh, intensity, um, uh, color intensity, lights and darks being exactly the same. Uh, this was just a very small tweak to make these two like light spots here and here a little darker. Then a couple, of, a little bit more of using this brush uh, in a couple areas. Then here's where the the really big textural stuff starts inside this group here. And um, I frequently, as well as grouping larger stuff, I also do subgroups inside of the main groups. And one of the reasons I do that is so I can then apply masks to the entire group. So you can see here uh, I have like six layers in this group, and each of these layers have masks. But then all this together, once it's flattened all this in the program. Um, I can then apply a mask to all of that. And in this case, the mask is uh, this area here and here, just to uh, erase it a little bit. Uh, but this applies to all the stuff below. So this is a technique I use pretty frequently. 
So let's quickly go through these. So the first one down here um, is yeah, so the first one down here is actually a photograph from Utah. So one of the things I did uh, on this uh, book was uh, we did a research trip to Utah, and I took tons and tons of photos. And I believe this is a photo of Canyonlands, which is uh, a whole series of giant canyons. And um, I used a lot of photo reference from Utah uh, inside these paintings. So to start off with, I drop it here. And you might notice that uh, this is set to normal here, uh, but you can still see all the brown underneath even though this is a black and white image. And the reason is because even though this is set to normal, when you go up to the, the group here, this group is set to hard light. And hard light allows you to use the, uh, the black and white of the image uh, to mix with the stuff below it. So um, as well as using this mask here uh, on this uh, subgroup, I am also using this as a way to sort of add all of these images together in a normal way and then to apply that as hard light to the surface so I still can see all of these layers below. So start off um, photo from Canyonlands, a uh, little tiny tweak just to get rid of a little bit of that. Here is another uh, photograph just of some dirt and I use it to get rid of some of the deeper canyons because I'm going to have people walking across this so having deeper, deeper canyons doesn't make much sense because they would fall inside. But it still leaves a lot of sort of the, the smaller level canyon stuff uh, from that original photograph like you can see here and here. And then that just sort of removes some of the contrast to that area a little bit. Uh, another photo from Canyonlands up here again set to normal. And then that's just a very small tweak of a, a few extra like rocks or something in the middle. So that whole thing then if I set this to pass through, you can see this is uh, what it would look like normally, but since it is set to hard light, it reveals the color that is below in these lower lower levels. And then this last thing is just a tiny fix over here to get rid of that little bit. So that's the, the ground surface. And you can see, the, so the ground surface is, is mostly a series of photographs that have all been dropped together using various of the uh, different um, shading modes, like hard light in order to get something that is is far more complex. Now I could have potentially found a surface that looked exactly like this in real life and taken a photograph and dropped it in, but since I wasn't able to, I constructed it using little bits and pieces of stuff that I had from other photographs. And this is a very common sort of matte painting technique in order to get uh, the look that you want to get. Okay, so let's move up to the sky. The sky is a, a lot simpler, and in the sky it starts off with this gradient and um, this is a gradient trying to show off something that's uh, got a lot of sort of dust uh, floating up near the, uh, the, the surface here. And uh, this was actually stolen from another image of mine. So I just took uh, this gradient from another image and dropped it in. And I think the gradient originally came from a real sky that I took a photo of. And I just um, stretched it to make it uh, a regular gradient rather than a more complex sky. And then this layer here is noise, and if you look closely down here, all this is doing is just adding a little bit of noise down at the bottom, because rather than having this be a smooth gradient, the idea is that this is supposed to be like sand flying around, and so you need a little bit of texture in there to give that impression. And I think this noise was just, uh, I went under filter, noise, add noise, and added a little bit of noise to, uh, to that surface. Then lightened up a little band right here. Um, so it's just normal with a, a really soft brush painted in. And then added a little more over here. Uh, one of the disadvantages of going through this as a layer breakdown rather than seeing it painted in real time is something like this isn't something I would know to paint when I'm doing stuff. I would have all these other layers in there and then I would say, oh, you know, actually I would like it if this looks a little bit dark here, so I'd make it a lot, I want to make it a little lighter, and so I go back into this layer and I add that. So even though we're going through the layers linearly, remember that some of these layers are things that I added later. I didn't add them in the order of going up like this, um, just to tweak little things to make it uh, look a little better once I have the other context of the other uh, layers. Okay, so the building, the main building here, this is a CG element. So this is something that I uh, painted this as a texture map and then painted this as a texture map and assigned it to um, a uh, shape that looks very similar to the Citadel. And this is so, I knew I was going to have a lot of pictures of the Citadel in the book. And so it made a lot of sense to uh, make a 3D model of it, or at least enough of a 3D model. This is obviously a texture, so I didn't go in and, and model all these details in here. 
but um, I could then uh, rotate it around and render it from different views and use it in a whole bunch of different paintings rather than constructing it each time in perspective. So um, that's what I did here, and um, virtually no lighting on here, um, just very, very simple lighting. And I'm going to construct most of the lighting um, in 2D, which I'm going to show you in a second. But just to uh, mention down at the bottom here, I also have a, a mask, so this is the original render. And then the idea is, is there's supposed to be a lot of dust and stuff under here. So rather than having this hard edge, I just went and I uh, blurred it out. And this doesn't look terribly good right now in terms of the uh, uh, it blending out, but it'll look better once uh, all more dirt layers that are up here um, and dust layers go in. So you'll see that in a bit. So, um, oh yeah, so this layer was actually a fix. Um, in the original version of this, I had this element up here and I decided later on that um, I, I liked it being a little bit smaller and so I went in and I just uh, rendered a uh, second version with the change to the uh, the citadel and then dropped it in over top of the old one so this was later on I'd done the whole image with the larger one and then later on I was like ah, I really want to tweak uh, uh, this little detail so I went in and added another layer in there now this is where I start doing the lighting in uh, 2D and so all I've done is I just um, made this shape and you'll notice I have a, a clipping mask here and if you don't know what a clipping mask is, all a clip, clipping mask is is it takes whatever is painted here and applies it only to the opacity of the thing below it. And so what this is doing is I'm just taking this side of the citadel and I'm making it darker by uh, painting black, clipping it with the uh, 3D model here and then reducing its opacity down to a lower value. And I know that the light is going to be from over in this direction, and so I'm starting to set it up where, okay, so the light's from this direction, this is going to be darker. Then here's another one, again, a set to clipping mask uh, to make this um, shape uh, darker here, so that this one is going to be the one that's going to be lighter. And then you can see here I'm making this side lighter, again, uh, to, to do the, uh, the, the lighting in 2D. And this one, instead of just doing white and then um, clipping it on there, all I did was I just uh, set up a... Uh, brightness contrast. You can see here I just, um, sorry, uh, a, a levels. And then I brought the, um, the, the light uh, down there and you can see as you change this it just gets lighter. So very similar uh, to using the black, um, just a, a different technique. Then this is a hue saturation and its purpose, you can see over here, um, I set it to colorize, set it to a purpley color. Uh, brought down the saturation a bunch and brought down the lightness a bunch and um, this is since the light is going to be from over here behind this thing this is actually going to be entirely in shadow and even so there's probably uh, I've added more light here and less light there but then on top of that the whole thing needs to get darker in order to have the the shadow look proper so that's what that's doing and then this is just a very soft brush I just painted a little bit more um, dust coming from uh, up here as sort of a, a gradient um, hovering down by the uh, the bottom. Okay, so now let's go up to the mist. And so this is where I was saying before where I'm starting to add um, some more mist down here. Let me uh, start off with this. So this is just painted again with a, a very soft brush, um, adding a bunch of mist down at the bottom as well as a big sandstorm coming through here. And this is just adding a little bit of noise, probably using uh, either the noise filter or this might have also been a uh, some sort of grunge texture that I just applied down there to make it a little bit uh, dustier. And uh, that one is just making, yeah, uh, so this just makes this area over here a little bit darker. And the reason for that, again, the light's going to be over here. And so if there's a cast shadow from this, the cast shadow will be going in this direction. Therefore this area of the mist would be a little bit darker um, and this area a little bit lighter. And then this is just a hue saturation to bring the saturation down so it's not quite as, uh, the color is not quite as uh, um, bright, it's a little paler. And then this is a technique I use a lot for things that are really big and that is I'll start off the bottom will have a lot of dust um, and then as you go up there'll be a couple of little sort of cloud banks, almost like it's going up into the clouds, the little streaks of, of mist up at the top, and so that's what these are. And again, painted with just a soft brush, adding a, a streak of mist here and a streak of mist there. And I find that really helps make uh, something look really large. So then this was just adding a little more mist back in the, the, the back area, so it's not quite as clear. And a little bit of mist down at the bottom to cover over this, because that wasn't quite as... Um, 
this layer here wasn't quite as full as I felt it needed to be. And then one last little bit, kind of over here. So you can see the difference there and there. Okay, now the settlers. So the settlers, I will show you them. This is a 3D element, and all I did was I took a, a really tiny person and I scattered it along a surface. So I made a surface that was kind of this winding trail going off into the distance, and then I scattered uh, people along it uh, going off like this. And then I added shadows, which is this next thing here. And rather than doing the shadows in 3D, I actually just used a, a 2D trick. And so what I did was I made a copy of the people la layer and, and then used uh, the motion blur inside of Photoshop. Uh, so if you go under filter and go under blur, there is uh, motion blur. And I just chose a distance, uh, an angle like this, so it's pushing it down, and then I gave it a distance. And what that does is it, it makes this little fake shadow looking thing. And you can see um, one of the disadvantages of Photoshop is that it's not very procedural, so I can't apply this filter and then go back and tweak it later. So in case I needed to remake the shadow layer at a later time, uh, what I did was I just wrote down the settings I used for the motion blur. So I can, uh, let's say I added a bunch of new people over in some different area. So what I'd then do is I'd copy this again. I would then uh, run this motion blur setting to get the shadows back, and I would have um, have these shadows. Anyway, just a nice little trick to sort of add uh, 2D shadows after the fact, rather than doing them uh, inside of 3D. And then, of course, these are way too um, dark. They're not integrated into the environment very well, so I uh, went in and just with a soft brush painted some fog, and set that as a clipping mask on top. And then I guess one more little tiny bit of fog over there. Obviously, I could paint both of these fogs on the same layer, um, but I, I, I frequently do multiple layers because I'm always going back and tweaking. And, and if I put everything on the same layer, then it's hard to go back and tweak. Some people really like doing stuff all kind of on as few layers as possible. And if I'm doing something more painterly, I'll tend to do that as well. But if I'm doing something that's supposed to be more photographic, I'll tend to use a lot of layers. So I always have lots of options to go back and tweak and turn things off and, uh, and on. Okay, now this mist here is another example of, I didn't paint this mist and then paint the next thing. This was something where I painted the close mountain here and then afterwards realized I needed this mist. So the problem was, is uh, with this mountainy bit up here, up close, I was sort of noticing that the amount of texture here is kind of similar to the amount of texture back there. And so when you look at it from far away, they kind of blend together a little bit. And there's different ways of, of doing, uh, fixing that blending problem. One way is to make this darker and make this lighter. Uh, another way is to have this be a radically different color. But in this case, what I decided to do was just add a little mist back here. And this is pretty simple, just painted with a, um, a soft brush. But uh, frequently when you're doing these kind of paintings, it, it's all about uh, these landscape paintings. It's all about painting uh, something that's dark against light against dark against light against dark. And so here's kind of a good example here where you have down at the bottom here, you have you know the dark of the shadow and then you have sort of the light area here then this mist is even lighter so that uh, this has contrast behind this then after this sort of light area you have something that's a little bit darker with more texture and then you have the thing that's darker here uh, than this is and then this is again something that's again lighter which is the uh, the, the sky so a lot of time there's a lot of sort of painting layers of, of uh, you know, dark and light and dark and light and dark going off into the distance and also detail where it's like, okay, very detailed, not very detailed, very detailed, not very detailed, detailed, and then not very detailed. And that's all to get this, this sense that you're going off into the, uh, into the distance, off into the atmosphere. Okay, now let's get into this mountain area down here, this sort of cliff, this uh, ledge that uh, Inc and Landis are going to be uh, standing on. So a lot of layers inside of here. So let's go down and uh, turn them off. Okay, so um, this area over here is very similar to this area over here. So I'm just going to talk about this and you can sort of infer how I did this. So I started off with, um, again, going to my uh, Utah photographs. Oh, this is super zoomed in. So this is a photograph uh, from Canyonlands. And you can see here, um, when I was there, I was taking all these great photos. And when I saw this over here, I said to myself, oh, this is perfect. This is a nice little ledge overlooking 
um, you know, some canyons down here. This is going to be perfect for this painting I was planning on doing, which is this painting here. So it was um, great finding this, and I took a whole lot of photographs of this area here. And I don't think it was this exact photo I used, but it was a similar one I used to, to do this over here. Um, obviously, I painted the guy out who was uh, standing here. So let's put that back there. So I started with one of those photos you can see here. And down to the bottom here. So I started with the photo and just uh, sort of dropped it in, in the area that I knew that ink was going to be standing. And uh, one of the first things I needed to do was this had like actual greenery on it. And in uh, the ink desert planet, there's no greenery at all. And so I knew I was going to have to paint these out, but that wasn't that big a deal. So um, I started off over here. You can see I got rid of that one. And this it was just using all the standard clone tool sort of things to clone like a bits of areas over here to get rid of it there and bits of this to get that over there. And then uh, on, I removed, decided I didn't want that shadow at that edge, uh, which was over inside of, uh, inside of here. Uh, I, if I remember right, there was some sort of like overhang up over here, which caused that shadow. So I didn't want that. I wanted uh, that to be all clear. So I just painted in uh, that area using um, a combination of the uh, clone tool and then also some, uh, some hand paint. And this is just um, changing the contrast a little bit. This is another uh, clone layer where I just cloned out a little bit more of the grass. And this down here is just lightening up this lower area a little bit. I thought it was going a little bit too much towards black. Let's see, what's this one? Hmm. This one, no layer. Okay, well, I guess that's a blank layer. That happens sometimes where I'll just accidentally leave a blank layer in there. Um, so this one here, um, I felt as though this area over here uh, needed a little bit more texture to it. It was a little bit too flat, so I just went in, um, added a, a very slight bit of another photograph, uh, set to 75%, just to add these little extra uh, ridges over here. A few more of the same thing over in this side. Then I decided that rather than having it flat over here, I wanted something that kind of bulged over in this area. And so what I did was I took a photograph of a completely different rock and I dropped it in. And the other advantage this thing has is you can see just by plopping it there, it gets rid of a bunch of extra grass there kind of for free. So these are two completely different parts of rock that are, are merged together. And now I'm going to go about making sure that they have kind of the same lighting on them. So um, this one just takes the saturation down a little bit. And this one lightens that area down here so that this rock looks like it's sort of sitting on top of, uh, of that rock there. Then this is a hand-painted layer that I just painted with a very small uh, round brush. And all I did was I got rid of the last sort of bits of um, uh, tree down there. And since this uh, shadow area here is kind of purpley, I wanted that same sort of purple feel in the shadow areas of this. And here you can see the shadow area is more... Uh, more orange. Like one thing about this is you can see like this area here is where the light is coming and this has similar lighting which is great. The light is coming from this direction. When you merge uh, different uh, things together, different photographs, you want to have the light generally from the same direction. But I was getting much more spill bounce light here, uh, orange, than I was down here. So I just corrected that by doing a little bit of hand painting. To still leave a little of the orange but then go into purple, the same sort of purples you, uh, you see down here. And uh, yeah, then I needed more space for Ink and Landis to stand. So I um, took, um, again, uh, the clone brush and then cloned a little bit more, uh, more into there, which also helped seat these sort of rocks together. So it looks like these rocks are all part of the same photo when they actually aren't. And then a little tiny edge there. So then that is all in a subgroup, which I then uh, darkened a little bit with uh, Brightness Contrast. Could have used the levels, but uh, used Brightness Contrast instead. Um, what was this one? Oh yeah, uh, I felt that the uh, this area here was actually not going quite purple enough, and so what I did was I just took this area down here and I painted it in a little bit more purple and set it to color. So it left the brightness the same down here, it just made it a different color. Then took the top and made it a little bit more uh, darker brown, 
and then removed some of the saturation with another hue saturation to uh, integrate this together because if we'd left that I mean if you look here you know this is way more desaturated and this is way more saturated and sometimes you want that contrast but in this case it made more sense to blend them together a little bit more uh, otherwise the the eye was just going to see way too much uh, saturation contrast here so another layer making it a little bit darker, just a little bit of hand paint. Uh, a couple little tweaks to the rock here to get rid of... Yeah, like this part here is really bright, and so it's kind of drawing my eye, and I didn't want my eye to be drawn down to this area, because the eye tends to be drawn to areas that have a lot of contrast, and so I just painted that out and left a little something in there, but not nearly as bright. Uh, fixed a shadow over there. And then this was, I kind of felt as though this area here had some contrast to the detail, whereas this was now, some of that contrast was missing. And so I just went in and uh, took some of the areas that were a little bit darker and made them a little bit darker uh, further, so that this area here had sort of the same level of, uh, of detail in the, uh, in the shadows. And so there you go. You can see how I took uh, basically two photos and then used a combination of hand paint and the clone brush and a whole bunch of different layers to make it all one continuous piece of rock so I could have the rock be the, the shape I wanted to for uh, Ink and Landis to then stand on top. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to show you is this ink layer and uh, ink is a 3D model, um, textured and modeled in 3D and all I did was render him from the back and gave him a little bit of lighting but really the lighting it's a very boring lighting scenario in 3D. It's, uh, uh, in fact, I think it might actually be my mo uh, model lights rig as opposed to any sort of dramatic lighting. Because like the uh, Citadel back here, we're going to do most of his lighting in 2D after the fact. So um, even a shadow is just something I painted. So the shadow is down here, uh, just painted with a simple brush um, based on the fact that the light is going to come from over in this spot. So you know, did the shadow going off over in this direction. And then this is paint fix. Oh, oh yeah, okay, so if you look down here, um, if I'd wanted to, I could have rigged ink to uh, be really, really detailed. Like, uh, he is rigged in the sense that if I move this arm, you know, the rest of the arm will go with it and whatnot. But something like these wires down here are much more difficult to rig because they need to stretch as the leg moves. And if you really like rigging, you know, feel free to go about and do this in your um, uh, in your model. But um, I decided it was much easier to, for those sort of details, just to paint them in. So these wires here are rigidly attached to his legs, which means that they're going to be, they're just going to pop off of this thing when uh, these legs move. Because you can see this leg is kind of uh, skewed this way, and so this popped off. And then I just go in and I, I paint that in with, uh, um, in 2D. So a nice way to sort of do a really rough rigging of your character without having to do a lot of rig, and then you can go in and just uh, paint out any of the uh, uh, weird rigging artifacts that, uh, that you see. So uh, that group there, I then um, hit with this levels, which is just making it a little bit brighter. Then this one is going in and bringing um, it dark again. Uh, as well as being dark, it's reducing the contrast a little bit. So this is just set to normal at 25%. Then this here is a hue saturation that is bringing uh, him more purple. So it's set to colorize, set to purple, uh, brought the saturation down, and then brought the opacity down. So this is not unlike what happened over here at the Citadel, where I'm adding sort of the, the, the purple color um, to show that he's in shadow over here. Uh, I've decided that uh, purple is going to be sort of the main main shadow color. And you'll also notice that this is set to 54%, and that's because I don't want to remove all the color and make it all purple. I just want to add um, a little purple cast to him. So um, you would never put this up to 100% unless you wanted him to be entirely purple. I still want some of the underlying color, but just a bit. Um, yeah, I was just a, this one little area here, it would just look a little too clean, so I went in and just added a little bit of dirt. Um, oh, and then I went ahead and added a little bit of an edge highlight here. So again, very small, regular uh, brush and just uh, painted in a little bit of light as though, uh, again, the light is coming from this angle and it's hitting these edges. And another one around the edges, this one's a little blurrier, just to add a little bit more uh, uh, of the light over there. So you can see all this is basically just lighting him uh, inside a 2D after the fact. Then here's Landis and 
Landis was uh, hand painted on top of photos. So if you look here, I got a photograph of a guy walking on a beach. And so you can see like this part here is more the original photograph. And then the top part is more hand painted, like his, uh, his cape. And this was a little bit before um, we had the final design for the Landis that showed up in the book. And so his design is a little bit different. It still has all the same elements. He still has the cape and the hood and, uh, and that kind of stuff. But it is a little, uh, he doesn't have his backpack that he does in the final. But since this is supposed to be a poster, it's supposed to be more evocative of the feel rather than being completely accurate and in the story. I, I didn't think it was that big a deal. Um, so then a shadow, very much like uh, ink, just uh, hand painted in. Then turned him purple, same way as I did with uh, with ink. Added a little bit of an edge highlight here from the light that's coming here, and then a little bit more of a blurry edge highlight to just lighten stuff over on uh, on that side. And there we have our two main characters. Okay, now uh, in the effects area. Okay, so in the effects area, all I did was I just added one extra shadow. Uh, you remember I, I darkened this a little bit in one of the uh, mist layers to make the mist a little bit darker, but I felt it needed a little bit more darkness here in order to really sell the light coming from this angle. So just painted with a very soft brush and, and put there in this layer. Okay, so this lens area here, this is where I add the, the actual sun that's behind here. And what this is, is this is a lens flare. Um, there was this guy that did a bunch of uh, photographs of real lens flares uh, in HDR. And um, so I, I, I bought them online and uh, I use them all over the place in a lot of these images. And uh, this one, I, I took his flare and uh, I blurred it a lot. It was much uh, sharper than this one, but I wanted sort of a more blurry effect. Then the, this hue saturation up here is just making it a little bit more saturated and bringing it a little bit more uh, um, uh, towards the red area. And then, let's see, there we go. So on top of there, and then this is set to linear dodge. And so that's so it's additive. And usually with lights and suns and things like that, you want to set it to additive so it adds on top of the surface. Uh, and any area that's black just uh, disappears and any area that's uh, going towards white is then added on top. And then I added just a tiny little bit more of this sun thing here, just to hit the point home that this is in fact the sun. And then a bunch of cameras uh, has this effect where it'll actually do this sort of uh, horizontal anamorphic streak that happens. Uh, anamorphic cameras do this. And so I use that um, uh, a lot to uh, give the, the impression of this being more photographic. And this is just hand painted in. Uh, line um, again set to linear dodge just like the uh, the Sun itself so the on top texture um, is something I like doing where if you look at this let me turn this off for a second and, uh, disable this so uh, this is hand painted uh, on a real piece of paper and I just took a brush and sort of brushed back and forth on it and what I'll do frequently is I'll take this and I'll uh, drop it on top of a painting and I'll set it to something like soft light or overlay or one of these modes uh, set the opacity way down uh, and then brush out the parts that I don't want and all this does is just adds a little bit of extra texture up in the sky so it's not quite as blank um, gives it a tiny bit of a painterly feel but on top of that also maybe gives the impression of you know there's a wind whipping up here with a little bit of uh, dirt or, or grime so that's something I like um, to try to avoid stuff looking uh, too, you know, perfect and smooth and clinical. Uh, it's just sort of an after thing. So now I have a color correction layer up here, and this has a lot of different color corrections. So I'll go through these guys. So first I have some film grain. And all the film grain is, is it's just a, a layer. I went here and added this uh, add noise. I then uh, went in and color corrected this. So it was a little bit more red overall, a little bit more uh, more purple set to overlay at 10% uh, to give sort of a, a film grainy type of effect. Then, uh, let's see, this one here is set to soft light and it's just making this part a little bit darker down here and this part a little bit lighter here. So lighter towards the sun and then darker in the front. Uh, this just does that a little bit more. Another layer just to make this part a little bit darker so that the eye is kept more in sort of this area here. Uh, even darker down at the, the bottom corner here. 
Then I lightened the whole thing with uh, levels uh, a little bit. It was getting a little bit too dark. And then this is a hue saturation which uh, is making stuff a little golden. So uh, rather than keeping it sort of more in the, um, the, the yellows, I decided to bring it a little bit more red. So bringing stuff a little more orange. And so um, this is uh, throwing the hue at the orange color. Uh, keeping saturation the same, set the color eyes, and then set the opacity to 31 so that we're not, again, erasing all the colors that are inside of here, but sort of unifying the whole thing with a consistent color. So this is a vignette. Uh, vignettes are commonly used to direct the eye, so a vignette will take certain areas and make them darker so that you're not looking there. And so that's exactly what this is doing. This is just making this corner darker and this corner darker so that when you look at the image you focus on the area that's lighter with the more contrast which is again in this uh, in the center. Then this is a very soft little glow I have going on um, painted with a soft brush just to um, spread uh, have a little light seeping from the sky over um, into the uh, shape of the citadel. Um, what was this pink layer? Oh yeah so if you go up here you might notice that for whatever reason with all these different layers on top, this area is looking a little bit yellow and then there's this pink area and I thought that looked a little strange having this, this yellow and then all of a sudden going to pink. And so what I did was I painted that same color of pink on this layer with a soft brush. I set it to color so that it doesn't affect the light or the dark, it just affects the color of this area and then uh, put that right there. And so this thing now is more consistently pink than going to yellow down here rather than having this sort of sudden like you know there's like pink here and then yellow splotch uh, up there and then this was then after looking at that I said this whole area is a little bit too pink and so I did one last one which is a yellow set to a, a low opacity and color just to bring this a little bit more yellow and then this final hue saturation brings up the saturation a little bit and brings it a little bit closer to uh, um, to, to the reds Okay, so the next thing is actually going to involve us swapping programs. Um, so once I've gotten my image painted the way I like it for the most part, I usually add a few more filters on top using a program called Magic Bullet Looks. Uh, and then I bring the result of that image back into my Photoshop file. So let's go over to that program right now. Okay, here we are in a program called uh, Magic Bullet Photo Looks. And uh, this is a very simple compositor that lets you do a bunch of uh, filters to your uh, your image. And sadly, shortly after I bought this, uh, the company that makes it is called Red Giant. Uh, they actually discontinued the software, which really sucks. They still have Looks, which is their After Effects plugin, so you can still use it there if you want to. But um, uh, After Effects is more geared for doing you know sequences and video uh, sequences of images, whereas this uh, Photo Looks was really for still images, whether it's photographs or, in my case, CG images. So you never know though. Um, I'm constantly bugging them to see if they would consider um, selling the program again and upgrading it. And uh, if you guys like what you see here, then it might be uh, worth you uh, poking them as well and seeing if you can convince them. So the way this program works is you have all these uh, different looks which are over here. And these are presets that you can go through and you can quickly just choose any of these presets and see how it looks on your uh, on your image. And all these presets are, are a series of um, uh, filters down here. So one thing you can do is you can apply a different look and once you find one you like you can then tweak the parameters down here. Or you can uh, do this from scratch because if you go over here under the tool section here are all the tools that make up all the presets over in the, the look section and then you can just manually add these and, and tweak them down uh, over in this spot. So um, here's what the original image out of Photoshop looked like. And now let me go through these different uh, filters that I applied. So the first one is diffusion and this is sort of like a general glow which takes light areas and makes it uh, um, glowy and uh, just does a good job of taking this color and, and seeping it in around these, uh, these edges here. Then Haze Flare does something kind of similar. It creates sort of a hazy effect, so it's a little bit like a glow. Um, but um, I tend to use these two together. This one tends to be a little bit more directional. And you can see, if you look at the original image here, just adding these two immediately gives uh, the image a lot more life, which I really like. So I, I tend to start off with these two. Then here is an edge softness. 
And uh, what this does is stuff inside the circle is um, completely um, sharp. And then stuff over here uh, goes to blurry uh, based on whatever the blur size you have over here. And it's a, a nice gradient going from uh, not blurry to blurrier to blurrier all the way to you know fully blurry over here. And so what this does is it's sort of like a vignette, uh, except instead of it being a color vignette where things go darker around the edges, it, it goes more blurry around the edges. And also sort of um, looks a little bit like um, a depth of field, although it's not doing a true depth of field calculation and it's not doing it accurately, but it gives the same sort of impression. Like you'll sort of, this stuff off being kind of blurry means your eye is not going to look there and it's going to focus on the area that it should be looking at, which is sort of in the middle. Then this is another film grain. Um, I used a, a film grain or something film grain-ish uh, inside of Photoshop uh, as one layer, but this is an actual film grain where you have controls over uh, the, the red, green, and blue and a bunch of other um, things inside of there to get a more realistic film grain. And then the last one is a shutter streak. And the shutter streak is a, a fun little uh, trick. If this were real film, uh, you uh, like a real video, you would have this frame and then you'd have the next frame up here and then you'd have the previous frame down here. And if this were on real film, what would happen is um, that a little bit of this color would bleed into the next uh, frame up here and a little bit of this color would bleed into the frame down here. And so this uh, does the same thing. It just uh, simulates that. And what it does is it just sort of copies some of the, of the stuff up here and puts it down there and some of the, the brightness uh, down here and puts it up there. And so in this case, it's very subtle. All you see is really it's making this a little brighter because it's taking some of the brightness up here and, and streaking it down there. So all this stuff is stuff that is just trying to make it look a little bit more filmic, a little bit more photographic. And even if it's subtle, it can help give the impression that this is uh, a little bit more realistic. So once I've done this, uh, all this stuff, um, procedurally, I will then take um, the uh, final image and I will export it back into Photoshop. And then inside of Photoshop, I will do a, a last uh, couple little tweaks. So let's go over there now. Okay, so we're back over inside of Photoshop, and in this group here, Final, um, I just take the image that I saved out of Photolooks and dropped it in. You can see the difference here between the, the, the Photoshop one I sent to Photolooks and then the one after Photolooks. And um, just to note, all, all the different filtering sort of things you saw in Photolooks, you can do inside of Photoshop, it's just not nearly as easy to do. Like for example, say that vignette. So if you wanted to do the vignette, what you'd have to do is you'd have to take all this and collapse it, and make an image and then blur that image and then kind of use a mask to keep blur down here but then no blur in the center. And that's fine, you can do that in Photoshop, but the problem is, is later on, let's say I now make a tweak to my painting uh, down in one of these layers, I then have to redo that whole procedure in order to uh, get my vignette, uh, my, my, my soft vignette back. And that's why using the procedural filters inside of uh, Photolux is so great because I can just drop the original image in and it'll automatically do all those uh, filters again without me having to manually redo them. Um, and so that's why I, I use that program. It would be nicer if that um, those filters were inside of Photoshop, of course, uh, but they aren't, um, so, or they are, but not the technique of doing it procedurally. And so I've decided that the trouble of moving the image out of Photoshop into Photolux and then back into Photoshop it's, it's annoying, but it's not annoying enough to outweigh the use of the procedural filters. So in some paintings, I actually do a lot more procedural filters inside of Photolux than this one. This one was a little more subtle, um, and I do a little bit less inside of Photoshop. It all kind of depends on, on my mood or, or what uh, uh, tools I know I, I have and need and which seems to be the easier to pull off. So, okay, so once I got the, the final in there, uh, under extra, there's just a few last little tiny tweaks that I did on top. And so this one here, oh, this was just a little tiny bit of rock that I dropped in. Um, just because I, looking at it, I felt as though without it, it was a little bit flat here and I want a little bit more definition there. So just drop that in. Um, this is just a very slight tweak to bring the blacks up a little bit so that the blacks are a little bit blacker. Then this is a tiny little glint right here, uh, just to give it a little, a uh, little bit of a pop. And so that was just a painted, um, a little bit of white in the center, a little bit of uh, pink on the outside, and then set to a linear dodge again, so to add on there. 
then that is just making it a little bit darker because uh, the original one was a, a little bit too light. Then this is so oh, same thing except it's a little bit of a glow. So um, to glow it a little bit further, I went in with a soft brush and just painted a little tiny bit of light there. And then what's this last thing? Oh yeah, and uh, the last thing was I also noticed that I felt that this was maybe a little bit too overall shiny. And so I went in and uh, just dirtied that up a bit. So I could have done this stuff uh, instead of under uh, above the final. I could have done this down here. Um, but since there were such tiny tweaks, I just decided to do it down here rather than do it down down below and run it through uh, Photolux uh, again. And then the last thing up here is the title. And all the title is is the ink logo. And then looking at it here, it's a little bit tough to read because this is not dark enough back here. And so I went in and I added just a couple of layers which make it a little bit darker back there to uh, show off the, uh, the logo itself. And then uh, a little bit light up at, the, uh, up, up at the top. And there you go. So that is the image uh, for the uh, ink poster. So thank you very much. I hope you found this interesting. Um, and uh, hopefully this gives you some indication of how I went about making this particular image and maybe how you can use some of these techniques in your own images. And uh, visit my website, neilblevins.com, if you'd like uh, to see more tutorials on these kinds of subjects. And I also have a YouTube channel, uh, which you can subscribe to if you want to be let known when there are more videos uh, to watch. And hopefully you enjoy the other uh, ink-related videos uh, that uh, came with the book. So thank you very much and have a good day.